Hey guys, it's Ann over at Plan Obsessed and I asked a question in one of our last videos if people wanted to have me do a video on my bedding. So that's what we're doing. So what I wanted to first start off with is a little bit of talk about why I do what I do. Um, of course it's evolved over time, you know, evolving techniques as well as learning from everybody, including many of the people watching today, as well as reading books and um, succeed and fail. So first thing I want to say that I have two aspects of my bedding material. There's the dry mix and the wet mix. And when combined together and aged is what I use for my bedding nowadays. So first of all, I want to go over the the dry mix and what it is, what are the components, and why do I use what I use. First of all, the dry bedding has the shredded paper component, which is basically junk mail, magazines, bills, any sort of paper that I have, including any sort of cereal boxes or Amazon boxes that I can put through my shredder. The second component is the grit. I put about a quarter cup in with every batch that I make, but over time it probably, I don't ever finish using a batch. That's why it's, it's aged bedding. It kind of is self-sustaining. So I, the second component is eggshell. Now, we eat a fair amount of eggs in our household, and so each batch contains about 12 eggshells that have been ground up in a coffee grinder, give or take about a quarter cup. Here's my eggshell. As you can see, it's uh, today I put it in the oven because I had something in the oven, but uh, normally I do it in the microwave just on a, on a plate, but it does go probably pretty fast much faster in an oven but so I get everything super crunchy like this and then I put it in my spice blender. My little spice grinder I fill the little cup about halfway full and then I pour it in the grinder. I have blended what was probably 10 eggs maybe 12 and this is just a little little baking pudding dish here and you can tell it doesn't amount to very much. Um, some people like to um, go and make sure that they're all very small and that everything gets blended up. I just have an old, I don't know, sifter thing. over back in the coffee grinder for another round and then everything will be super tiny small to help your little wormies eat their dinner. The third component of the dry mix is coconut coir. Now you don't have to use it, it's actually more of a functional than it is for the worms themselves. Basically a lot of paper and a lot of cardboard or paperboard like cereal boxes, they have a component of glue that you know makes them stick together in the first place. And one of the best ways to keep the paper from clumping together in anaerobic clumps is to use a handful or a couple handfuls of coconut coir. It is a very um, tough substance that soaks up a bunch of water and it also is very fibrous, very fine. And it gets in between all those little paper particles and keeps them separated. So I'm going to put four cups in right now, dry. It will absorb most of the water that I'm going to put in. It comes in a uh, 20 pound brick and that will fill an entire wheel, wheelbarrow. So I'm just going to use a small amount and I'm going to add it this time. So you might ask, why do I do this? Why am I using junk mail? Why don't I use just coconut coir? Or why don't I just use something I can purchase? Well, one of my main reasons for doing all of this vermicompost mm -hmm. is to prevent things from going into the landfill. Now let's go on and talk about the wet component, which I'm going to call my mother mix. Okay, it's time to put together the wet mix portion of my bedding. This is what I call my mother mix. 
So first of all, I have some sifted worm compost. I put four of these, which is probably about six cups, in the bucket already last night because I wanted to get this whole thing started. But what I did not add was my kelp meal, my neem cake powder, and my molasses. Each are a quarter cup. Now if you don't have molasses where you are, you can always use honey. So, and then four gallons of aged tap water. I say add aged because a lot of tap water in the United States has chlorine in it, which is no good for the bacteria and it's also no good for your worms. So I just use old milk jugs, let them sit for a couple days, and all of the um, chlorine will vent off. Okay, so I already put the compost in there, so we don't need to do that, but we're going to go ahead and put in the neem cake powder, the kelp powder, and the molasses. Okay, so for everybody wondering, why do I have to let this sit? Why do I have to mix it in water first? Um, here's the reason. I don't know if you can see where it's kind of muddying my hand here. But a lot of these components, uh, you know, were wet and then dried and then sold to me as far as the kelp meal, the neem meal. Um, and so basically, you know, some of this is my um, worm compost that also was probably quite a bit drier than it should have been. But it is also, it has to dissolve in the water so that it can get all the good nutrients out of the, the mother mix that I'm making so that when I put it in with the, the dry paper and cardboard that it will soak it all up and then it will be bioavailable for the worms. Many of the nutrients that are in the kelp mill will continue on to be broke down in the compost with the worms and they will still be there when I feed the compost to my bonsais. And that's how I got into the side shoot hobby of worm farming. It all started with the trees, and the trees needed the really expensive fertilizer that comes from vermicompost. And I didn't want to spend hundreds of dollars on worm compost, and I thought, worms, I can do that. So now I have a whole bunch of worms, uh, and I spend more time on the worms than I do the bonsais. Here is my current setup. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dip some of the water and it will go right into that five gallon bucket. All right, I'll bring you back when I'm done. Okay, so this is the inner screen that is the 1 20th of an inch. Try and get you close enough to see it. So all of the larger compost things got caught in the 1 12th screen and then these get caught in here. I haven't seen a lot of cocoons but then I don't see a lot of the African nightcrawler cocoons. I don't know. I'm kind of blind to them for some reason. So I'm just going to gently squeeze out the water. Extract all of my good good stuff out of there. And there we have it. That's what all this has been about. And then what we're gonna do, got my bucket right there. I'm just going to take this and pour it over the top. I'm gonna probably put three of them in there. Let's say three. So not not two gallons. Over a gallon, but not two gallons. Well, let's just do one more. That coconut core is notorious for pooping up. I'm going to let this sit for a little bit and then I will bring you back and show you what the finished product looks like. 
All right, there you go. That's, that's the bedding. It still has some fine bits of the coconut choir that need to absorb still. But for the most part, that's it. It took half of that five gallon bucket to moisten as more than that. It's probably three of the five gallons to get all the paper so that it was all moistened. I'll have a little bit extra that I can water my plants with and water my peppers downstairs with. But that's, that's what it is. It does seem like quite a bit of a process, but um, it makes the paper go faster and it also does help with all of the, the food going faster because this is just a hotbed of microbes in a week or two. All right, guys. Well, that's the whole recipe. All of the stuff that doesn't go through I put right back in the worm bin that I got the vermicompost from in the first place. And this is for two reasons. It will give them a little boost of nutrients and neem cake and any um, really tiny little cocoons that would have lived in that compost. Uh, some of them they go a little dormant when they dry out and they can stay in there for quite a long time. And so by me putting them in water it activates them again and then they can go in the compost pile in the compost bin bag whichever one it is and then they can hatch now the reason why I strain it and put them into the same one that it came from is because certain things don't do well together from an environmental standpoint my African night crawlers have to stay in the house and stay warm enough because I do live in central Illinois and right now today it is negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit yeah, that's cold. That's super cold. Now my basement stays about 60, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And then of course, my house upstairs is between 65 and 70. So the African night crawlers actually stay in the warmest room of the house in the back. And that room stays about 72 to 75, which is a good temperature for the African night crawlers. So for the mix that we're making today, I'm using African Nightcrawler Vermicompost. So when I get done straining everything, I am going to put the solids back into the African Nightcrawler bin. Okay, so we've made it, we've put it all together. We're going to let it sit for a week or two if we have time. It's not necessary. Um, and then you're gonna feed that, feed it, every time that you give them food. So if you have your apples, bananas, coffee, broccoli, whatever, that you're gonna put in the bin, then you can cover it with this. And this will help the worms and the food break down faster so that you can get soil amendments even faster. So the next thing I wanna talk about is bonuses. Things that I didn't know, but now I do, that I really wish I knew sooner before first one is how much money I have saved. The amount of money that I used to spend fertilizing my fruit trees, my vegetable garden, my ornamentals every year, I'm willing to bet it was a couple hundred dollars. Shh, don't tell my husband. Oh yeah, it was that bad. I had six app where I have two apple trees. I used to have a, a plum and a peach tree as well as a 25 foot square vegetable garden and then a completely landscaped yard. Which, you know, if you buy money, you know, if you buy expensive flowers, you want to fertilize them and make them healthy too, because otherwise you just wasted your money. So hundreds of dollars a year in just fertilizer. Fruit tree stakes and granules and bags and dragging them from the grocery store or some big box star and then bringing them back and putting them all over the place and then watering them in and then accidentally burning the crap out of your grass and then you have bald spots and then horrible. Time consuming and expensive. And now, if you've watched any of my videos, I have quite a few worms now and I probably get to harvest about 30 to 50 pounds, probably a month, easily. And you're like, what are you gonna do with all that? Do you sell it? No, I don't sell it. 
I, I have not at the point where I could sell it yet. I still have the fruit trees. I still have my vegetable garden. I still have all my ornamentals. I need my vermicompost. And I put probably, f I don't know, 50, 100 pounds on each one of the apple trees this year. I've had those apple trees for 20 years. And I had so many apples. I'm not kidding, it filled half the garage. Five gallon buckets, big laundry totes. I had to bring in the kids to help harvest them all. It was nuts. Some of those apples, I'm not kidding, not exaggerating, were this big. It was crazy. And they were awesome. They also tasted fabulous. And another weird thing, all the Japanese beetles that I get, they didn't bother the apple tree this year. I didn't have those weird spots on the leaves. So there seems to be almost like added benefits of some sort of pest control with the vermicompost as well. I don't know exactly what the mechanism is. With garden um, vegetables, the, you know, any splashing that happens as it rains or you water, some of the, the beneficial bacteria or fungus get splashed onto the plants and so that does give them a little bit of a boost to be healthier to keep the bugs away. But I don't know what it does for the apple trees, but it does. It was nuts. I've never seen so many apples in my, more than in a grocery store. You know, those big huge racks, more than that. Um, additionally, I do have grapes as well. And the Japanese beetles two years ago, before I had worms, decimated them. We went, I mean, they were completely naked. They didn't have any leaves at all. They took them down to like lace and then they all fell off. I didn't get any grapes, no grapes at all. Um, and I put probably a hundred pounds of the Roma compost underneath um, in the fall. I think because I had some extra and I was hoping something would help. You know, hope it would live after being completely denuded of leaves. I thought, oh my god, all those grape plants are going to die. Uh, you know, give them this vermicompost and maybe it'll be like a band-aid. It'll help them get through the winter. Um, well, they took over the entire side of the property. They actually wrapped around the, um, the siding in the house and they kept on going. I mean, they had 20 foot, 20, 25 foot run as it is and they kept on going. I had to cut them back three times this year. It was crazy. Now, I still didn't get a lot of grapes but they're pretty young plants. But I did get two gallons of grapes, which was better than the zero, not a nothing, I got the year before. So another bonus is that this hobby that I've developed has become a teachable moment for all of those people that know me, work with me, live around me, um, because God knows you're going to hear about my worms. Have you heard about my worms? Some people, next door neighbor, she calls them turtles. When she gives me all of the free stuff that her household would generally put into the landfill, she gives it to me. But since she can't bear to think about tens of thousands of worms roaming in my basement, she calls them turtles. And she puts a sticky note on the bag of shredded paper and she says, turtle bedding. That's okay. She sticks her head in the sand, she's going to find worms. Whether it's the people I work with, the people I live near, my family, my friends, I think they've all become much more conscious of what they do and put in the garbage and the packaging they buy. I think they've all, you know, through my hobby, they've become more aware and I think that's better for the environment. Awareness is what it takes. Um, additionally, also, one last bonus, and this is weird, and only you worm people. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. If you've had a super stressful day, people are getting on your nerves, specifically people are getting on your nerves, you go to wherever it is your wormery is, and you just go down there and you play in the worms. Play with the worms, um, probably talk to your worms, let's admit it, we talk to the worms. Um, and it is so stress reducing. You're down there, and even in the dead of winter, when it's 20 below zero outside, you can have your hands in, in dirt and, you know, feel a, a connection, you know, with that, you know, it seems like the spring is so far away, and you're getting a little bit of uh, the winter blues. I think it really does help. Um, 
sometimes I go down there even if I don't, you know, need to feed them or, you know, anything. I just go down there and hang out with the worms. And oftentimes, I will bring my camera with me so that you guys can hang out with my worms too. Because they're cool worms. So, that's the whole story of the bedding. I'm going to put little clips here and there, as you will have already seen by the time you get to this point, if you get to this point. And I know, my worm people, you'll get to this point. So, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms today. Everybody, have a good night.